Have you ever had to do a job for which you had no idea how to do it? Maybe that first day of a new job sort of feeling? I was at a restaurant some time ago and the waiter came over and we asked what was in a certain dish and the young waiter said, I'll just go and check with the chef. So they went out, came back, great, good to hear from the chef what it was. We asked, <laughs> we asked for another dish explanation, one sec, they just went back out to the, <laughs> the chef, the kitchen came back and it's okay, we got the idea and the young person simply said, and we finished the sentence for them, it's your first day. And uh, they just relaxed and it was all good. But do you remember those first day of the job sort of feelings that we have from time to time? When we're not really sure all that's involved, what's required, but we give it a go anyway. I wonder if anyone's seen the movie Dave with uh, Kevin Klein. It's a 90s movie, 93, Sigourney Weaver and Dave. Kevin Klein played a guy called Dave who, because he looked exactly like the President of the United States, the President died and was out of the way and they put him in. And they trained him up to just hang in there until something else could happen. Long story, see the movie, but imagine being the President of the United States and the only reason you're doing it is because you look like him. <laughs> you know, do you press some buttons in the office? <laughs> just got to be careful which ones. And what about parenting? For those of us who are parents, I know not everyone is, but for those who have been parents, do you remember that feeling when you get home for the first time? <laughs> now what? <laughs> You're looking at this little thing. You, you, we're not really prepared. Everyone gives you lots of advice. Our own parents give us advice. But wow, you remember that feeling? Just that, I, I'm not sure what to do with this little life. We sort of get it what that feels like. Sometimes in church life, people are asked to do things or they're doing things and they're not really equipped to do it. We sort of get that in the church too. And leadership development and equipping men and women for ministry is one of the most important tasks of the church. And Paul talks to Timothy about that in his letters and no doubt in their life together as they shared it all back in the first century. We need to equip one another in the church for service. And so we're continuing our series. We've called it What Really Matters as we look at this letter to 2 Timothy, the last letter that we have at least recorded for us, from Paul to Timothy. He's in prison. His life is nearly finished. Paul knows that. So he's sharing some things, probably for the last time, to his young disciple Timothy or younger disciple Timothy and sharing things for Paul that really matter. And we've looked, first chapter was about what really matters is to live for the gospel, to think about what the gospel is, how it's changed our life and how we are living according to the truth and the transformation that the gospel brings as it connects us with the person of Jesus. And then we looked last week, chapter two, at this theme of do your best. Paul gave these beautiful images, metaphors of what it is to be a disciple of Christ, using images that talk about hard work and um, living according to the, to the rules and being, uh, living in a holy life. And, and these images were of doing your best because God deserves it. And today, as we look in the middle of the letter, 2 Timothy 3, our theme is to be thoroughly equipped. Uh, the title I've taken from verse 17 in the NIV translation it says this, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So just lifting that, 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 that phrase, being thoroughly equipped, as our next theme in this letter of what really matters. What really matters is to be thoroughly equipped. So a couple of, couple of thoughts on it. In the first nine verses, Paul talks about the context, the culture that Paul is living in and Timothy is living in. And it could have been written today. But know this, Paul says to Timothy, verse 1, chapter 3, know this, hard times will come in the last days. That's just a general comment for any time between the, the uh, 
Christ's ascension, and when he comes back, it's this period called the last days. But know this, hard times will come in the last days. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, demeaning, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, slanders, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, on he goes, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to the form of godliness but denying its power. Avoid these people, he's saying. He's not saying step out of the world, but he's saying don't, don't live with people like this and take on what they think and what they believe. Paul's saying be careful how you live, but understand the world you are living in. Understand your culture. There are things going on, Timothy, that you need to be aware of so that as you live for Christ, you'll be ready for what's going to happen. There's going to be opposition. There's going to be persecution. There's going to be hard times. And there's going to be wonderful times of seeing lives changed and God's church grow. But Paul is saying, part of being thoroughly equipped, Timothy, is to know your context. Look around and understand the context that you're in. We need to be aware of what is going on so that we can live wisely. Uh, Paul wrote in Ephesians about the spiritual battle, and it's like this here. Wow, what, what a battleground this description is. And it, it's just as true now, isn't it? That's a description of today, is it not? In many ways. Our world is wonderful. God made a beautiful world, but sin has, sin has distorted it, and the enemy is taking people into blind alleys. And we need to be aware of what the enemy's doing and what God is doing and get on with living for the gospel. He's talking here about family life. He's even talking about life in the church, so to speak, here too. Some of these people are in the church. They're not all outsiders. But what a summary. They're going to be lovers of self, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure. That's 2024, isn't it, around the world? Boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to parents. Don't forget that fifth commandment of the Ten Commandments is the first command with a promise in Scripture to honour your father and mother that you may live long in the, day, in the land. That's an important promise. Now, we haven't got time to talk about it here, but honouring your parents is not the same as obeying your parents. Some may think that very difficult, but it isn't. There are times when the Lord might take us this way or that way and we have to, <laughs> appropriately at the right age, be ready to say, this is what the Lord wants for me. But the years of honour never cease. And honour at times is to acknowledge and submit, yeah, for sure, but not always. But we always live to honour our parents. It's just interesting that Paul brings that one up. He says that there are those who have a form of godliness, so that's people who are looking like they're following God. They're probably in the church and in fellowships even, and they're holding to a form of godliness, outwardness, but they're playing religious games, looking good for the crowd. And these are some people inside the church as well. Jesus talked about it. Matthew 23 talked about people that sort of appear to be in the kingdom of God and yet are living corrupt lives on the inside. Jesus was very clear about those who are religious, particularly religious leaders who are not living the right life. So this is a word for the church as well as a word for the community as it were. But there's no power, he says, in their outward observances, holding to a form of godliness, verse 5, but denying its power. There's no power in fake... <laughs> dishonest living. There's no power in trying to fake the Christian life. The power, Paul talks about, we sung about it, and it is in chapter 1, verse 7, that Paul reminds Timothy, don't live in fear, Timothy, or timidity, but understand the Holy Spirit has given us power, love, and self-control. Power, love, discipline. So there is power in living the Christian life the way God wants us to live it, not with people who try and put it on and look good on the outside. And then, you know, he says, but as for you, verse 10. So he's saying, hey, that's what our context is like. But as for you, live differently. Understand the culture you're in, but don't be a part of the culture. Paul talked about this uh, elsewhere in the New Testament, Acts 17, a great chapter if you want to look at how Paul understands the culture he's in. He's in Athens. He's on the um, Mars Hill, called the Areopagus, a little hill right below 
the Acropolis, where all of the temples are, these amazing, you know, who's been there to the Acropolis? And a number of people, right? You, the, these incredible temples. And have you been, did you go to the Areopagus, that little hill built below it? Now, Paul is on there, and he says the city is full of idols. What's he looking at? He's looking at <laughs> these massive stone temples that have been there for ages. He's looking right at that and saying there's so much idol worship here, and his heart was distressed. But then he entered into these beautiful discussions with the Athenians, saying, hey, you worship gods you don't even know. There was an image to the unknown God. And he's saying, let me give a name to that unknown God. And he starts talking to them about the only true God. He understood them. He said he's read their poets. Who does that? Who would think that's a good idea? Paul does. He entered into the minds and the thinking of those who are not following God so that he can understand where they're at in order to bring an appropriate word to them, an apologetic, a defense of the faith, if you like, about where they're at. He entered their culture, he understood their culture, and then he talked with them so graciously and beautifully, listening to them, understanding them, using their books. In, the, in today, you'd be saying... You'd probably see some of their movies. You'd listen to their music. You'd read their poetry. You might read some of the things that they're writing in the world to understand. Friends, we can engage with the world, but we don't live there as such. We don't don't take our values from the world. We take our values from God. But we need to live in our culture, understand our culture, and speak the gospel to our culture in ways that are relevant. Paul modelled that. And even in the Old Testament, it's modelled too. There's a verse, I love this one, in 1 Chronicles 12. Uh, there's all of the people um, standing with David, King David, and we're, they're, they're with him. And it says of the men of Issachar, 1 Chronicles 12, verse 32, it says, the men of Issachar who knew the times and knew what Israel should do with what God had told them. So these people both know what God is doing and they know the times, they know the environment they live in. And friends, we need to do the same, and Paul has modelled that. Be in the world, but not of it. Spurgeon used to say, he used to train pastors uh, in yesteryear in the UK. His sermons went out all over the world. And he used to say, he wants people to come and train for ministry who have a newspaper in one hand and a Bible in the other. He wanted people to understand ministry from the Word of God and what the world was doing. The second thing that Paul is saying to be thoroughly equipped, not only understand your culture, but he says, follow a godly example, a mentor, if you like. Verse 10 to 13, he keeps going. But you, Timothy, understand the world, but don't be a part of it. But you have followed, past tense, you have followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, and endurance, and (laughs) along with persecutions and sufferings that came to me. You'd be going, yeah, 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 what? (laughs) Timothy would be thinking, yes, victories and faith and all this good stuff, but you've also followed my persecutions and suffering, Timothy. (laughs) Yeah, that comes along with it as well. In fact, all who want to live a godly life in Christ, verse 12, will be persecuted. He's reminding him here of what Paul has been to Timothy, a guide, a mentor, a disciple, someone explaining the gospel, living the gospel. Timothy watched him preach, share, get busted, (laughs) um, uh, put in jail. Timothy was watching all of that, learning from Paul, learning how to interact with people, learning to go deeper into the gospel. And this is one of the ways to be thoroughly equipped as well. Understand your culture and then follow a godly example, a mentor. The disciples followed Jesus. Timothy was following Paul. Who are you following? Ultimately, we all have to follow Jesus, clearly. It has to be said. It's critical. We all follow Jesus, but God uses the people of God to help us all follow as well, to encourage, to train, to equip, uh, to, to spur on, to demonstrate how to live for Christ, not just on the mountaintops when things are great, but in the valleys when it's tough and you can't even see the open sky. What's God doing there? We need to see that as well. Timothy has seen that in Paul. Do you have a mentor? Are you being discipled? In what ways are you looking for others to gain, uh, uh, to gain an idea of how to walk? 
with Christ. A disciple is just a learner, a follower. And we're always disciples, are we not? We don't graduate. And so we're always wearing an L plate. Some people don't like that. They like to know they've made it. They like to know they've done the training and there's a tick next to their name and I've got the certificate. Some people just love that. That's cool, great. <laughs> We've got to keep moving. We've got to keep going. We're always a learner. I was trying to find one of the old cardboard L plates and put it around today. <laughs> I couldn't find one. There's been no learner driver in my household for a long time. We're always a learner. Keep it in mind, friends. It's important. We do not arrive as the, the altogether disciple. The very word means learner. And so there's that humility that comes with being a disciple. We're not complete yet. We're continuing to grow. We carry our L plates around. So Timothy followed Paul's teaching. That's pretty clear. He followed his way of life, his conduct, his holy living, unlike the false teachers that Paul was just talking about at the start of chapter 3. It says he followed his purpose, his aim, the big picture for Paul. Timothy saw that, his devotion to Christ, his passion to live out the gospel. It says he followed his faith, his faith in God, his faith in the word of God. He said his patience, so he watched Paul deal with people. That would have been difficult. Paul dealt with some pretty difficult people. He followed his love. He could, have see, he could see Paul's love for God and love for others. And he followed, it says, to his endurance, the ability to tough it out. He, Paul, Timothy was watching Paul do the hard yards. Not just get together when things are good and we share some Bible answers and it's all great and we go home, but actually watch closely what's happening when life gets hard, when family gets sick and don't come home from hospital, when we lose those close to us and we wonder, what is God doing? When we don't get the job we think we should have got, when we didn't get an opportunity in church to do something we feel we should have, how do we respond to that firstly and then how are we modeling that to others too so that we can learn to grow in godliness not just handling good things but handling tough things timothy saw paul do that and grew because of it now paul reminds us here in verse 12 that when we live a godly life it's going to get hard we need endurance because we're going to be going through some tough times when the world that we've just described the world doesn't want to know that sort of message sometimes. It's beautiful that people respond to the gospel and God's always at work. But there are those who live in darkness who want the darkness. It covers their life, thank you. And they don't like to be revealed. They don't like to be exposed. The gospel exposes. The gospel brings light and truth into our life. And even for us, I don't like that sometimes, <laughs> if I'm honest. The gospel does that. It opens up. It gives us questions, beautiful questions from God. Neil, should you be doing that? Neil, is that helpful? Neil, is that the best thing you can be doing? And we need to help each other work through some of these things together. There will be opposition. And yet I love verse 11, yet the Lord rescued me from them all. There's that beautiful hope, that beautiful expression of Paul, even though we go through the valleys, Timothy, the Lord rescued me. We're going to revisit that at the end of the letter when we finish in a week or two. Part of following a godly example is to watch people and learn from them. And also, I just thought one of the biggest things I think we need to learn is how to take feedback. Because sometimes we're not good at taking feedback. It could be in a secular sense in your job where a line manager says something about your performance. It could be someone critiquing some of your work. But it's also in the church where we can provide feedback for people and share ways that we can all grow. And I think sometimes we need to <laughs> revisit this idea of how do I learn in a feedback situation? How can I receive that well? Because sometimes it stings, does it? Does anyone get this or am I just talking to myself here? Does that ring a bell? <laughs> so let's help each other grow. And that, at times, will mean providing some feedback. Hey, have you thought about doing it this way? Or I love what you brought to here, but there's what about this bit that you could also bring in? You know, we seek to encourage always. 
but sometimes that'll be providing feedback that helps someone go, oh, I didn't even think of that, thank you. Because what does that convey for the one hearing the feedback? Somebody cares for them. Somebody loves them. Somebody wants them to grow and do better. Is that not a good thing? So when feedback comes from that place, it's a good place. So that's one way that we can learn from a mentor. And to become thoroughly equipped, Paul's saying, have a godly example. The third thing is, oops, I've gone one, two more, is continuing to serve. In verse 14, he just says, hey, but you have followed my teaching. In verse 14, he says, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed. You know those who taught you. So the focus moves away from the past. You have followed my example to the future. Continue to do this. Continue in what you have learned. We never arrive. There's always an opportunity to serve. We're never done. We're never finished. Yes, our roles may change, of course. Mine certainly has over the years. All of ours has, whether it's in Christian service or in our jobs, they change. And that's okay. But Paul is saying, continue, Timothy. Continue to serve. A good way to be thoroughly equipped is to continue doing what you've learned about. Keep growing. Don't stop growing. It's part of our vision here. Growing people, knowing people. Keep growing. Continue to serve, Paul says. It might be said that you never forget how to ride a bike. But my thinking is, if I got onto a plane and we're about to take off and I hear on the intercom, it's your captain speaking, great to be with you again. I haven't flown for 25 years, but I think I get how this works. Confidence inspiring. Maybe you're just sitting on the, lying on the operating table and the surgeon's scalpel in hand. And just before you go under with the anaesthetic, you hear him talk to the anaesthetist and just say, have you ever done one of these? I'm not sure I've done one of these before. (laughs) Isn't it true that we would like those who are flying our planes, who are about to cut us open, that they're continuing to serve, that they're continuing to grow, that they're doing that... Did you do the extra module last week to train in this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, good. We need to update it. And sometimes we hate that. Like, oh, here we go again. Continuing development training. It's not our first joy point, is it, often? But it's so important to help each other keep growing. Paul says, continue, Timothy. Continue to serve. Don't get out of the game. Continue. It'll change. The emphasis will change. The roles may change. But continue to think through how you can serve. And remember, while we serve, we're serving out of God's spirit, not ours. God's strength, not ours. He's already said again in that verse 1, chapter 1, verse 7, that we have a spirit of power and love and self-control. God, God's spirit fills us with his power, not ours. We don't use our power. We learn to use the power God has given us. Our power runs out. Our power gets ugly. Our power gets me-ish. <laughs> My agenda, but God's power brings truth and light and strength. So continue to serve using God's power. Part of the motivation for Tim continuing to serve is because of whom he learned it. Paul himself, he would have learned that integrity inspires confidence, but he also learned it, remember, from his mother and his grandmother in chapter 1. Remember, he's learning this from godly people in his life. Remember that, mate, but continue to serve. The last thing in this chapter that helps me understand about being thoroughly equipped is is learning by the word of God. So important and perhaps the major aspect here. Verse 15, you know that from infancy you have known the sacred scriptures which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped, may be complete, equipped for every good work. And so the word of God, Paul focuses on this now to say this is how your equipping is going to be really focused. major area of being thoroughly equipped is to learn and obey the word of God. It's not just knowledge about the word, it's allowing the word to get in to develop wisdom 
All of us can look up anything in a second on Google and it fills us with knowledge. <laughs> but is that learning and is it wisdom? And that's part of what's going on here, that we can learn wisdom from the scripture. Uh, I read a little while ago, uh, Charles Swindle, who's been a major um, evangelical in the States, but he was saying a while back, he, he looked at some results of a high school uh, religion test. They had a quiz and some of the results he found quite interesting. Uh, one of the questions was, you know, what is Sodom and Gomorrah? And the answer was, well, Sodom and Gomorrah were lovers was one kid's response. Um, Jezebel, you may have heard of her. Well, one of the answers was, oh, Jezebel is Ahab's donkey. There's some similarities in Ahab's donkey's name, but the, the New Testament gospel writers, well, they were Matthew, Mark, Luther and John. You know, close. Probably get a turn up award, participation. Um, funny stuff. Eve was created from an apple. These are just high school students, but just testing what they know of the word of God. And uh, Charles found the, the classic was, what was Golgotha? And the answer was great. Golgotha was the name of the giant that slew the apostle David. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of things going on in that answer. <laughs> anyway, they're just, just kids talking about the scripture. But if we believe the Bible to be our guide, then it's a map. It will guide us. And, the, and one of the keys is not to distort the map but to look carefully and to see what God is saying. Clark Pinnock said, The Bible is a divinely provided map of the spiritual order. It contains directions and markings to guide people into reconciliation with God through Christ. The accuracy of the map is an important condition of its effectiveness. The distorted map can lead to shipwreck. Observation is the key here in getting into the Word of God. What do we see in God's Word? Not what we think we see, not what we might have heard was there, but what do we see as we sit before it? The power of observation. Um, Sir William Osler, a medical educator in the States, took his first year medical students through a particular exercise in class early as they began their medical training careers. And they're in the lecture room. And Sir William Osler's up the front and he said, we're going to learn about the power of observation today. Be careful as you look now and do exactly what I do. So he had a specimen jar filled with a specimen. And he said, one thing we can learn, men and women, about the body is that by tasting, we can perhaps understand what the patient has got wrong with them. You can diagnose through tasting. He said, be very careful, let's do this. He dipped a finger in the specimen and put it into his mouth. Passed it to the first guy, Sam, you were the first student. Takes it and then gingerly he watches as people do what he did and the, the jar gets passed around back to him. And then he said, men and women, if you had been watching carefully, you would have noticed I put this finger in and to the syrup, the specimen, and this finger into my mouth, and they all went. <laughs> then he proceeded to tell them, "It's just a cordial made to taste a certain way. Don't worry." But all he was trying to do was say, "Be careful and watch carefully." He didn't try to conceal it. He just did the different finger thing, and they just <laughs> didn't see that. Observation is critical when we come to God's word. Sometimes we have our own agenda because of certain authors or certain churches or certain you know, um, agendas of people. And we bring that to God's word. What I'd encourage us to keep doing is to come to the word of God with fresh eyes. Be asking, Lord, what do you want to show me through your word? Psalms talk about that. Lord, you know, open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. Beautiful. Beautiful promise. So the most important Bible study tool you have is not Google. It's not a Bible college degree. It is this. <laughs> the two eyes in your head. That's the most important Bible study tool we have to see with God what is in his word. Observation. What does the text actually say? Then we move on with some help and then tools and other things to interpret. What does it mean and then we move on to the application. It's only information if we don't apply the word of God. 
What does it mean for me? What is God asking me to do here? And so we need to get on to application as well. My journey as a pastor involved being called to Gaumea Baptist Church as a youth pastor. I hadn't been to Bible college at all. My journey of being equipped was in other ways. It wasn't through college initially. I went to college and I, got through, I came out of college as well. Um, as our pastor Darren is doing, he's just finished his college last year. It's great. And he's now going through some final accreditation studies, which is wonderful. That'll probably happen this year, which is great. But I turned up in, I was at Gaimia Church for years as a young and became a Christian in my teens, got involved in some leadership training and mentored and discipled and got involved in some campus ministry. I went to New South Wales Uni as a student and uh, did a science degree in zoology and God called me out of that into some full-time Christian service. I went in back on campus as a student worker. Loved it, talking to students about Jesus and discipling leaders and training. Wonderful days. But based on that, my pastor at the time saw in me something I didn't see in myself. And he said, our youth pastor's just left. Why don't you apply for the job? I went, Pastor, don't, what are you talking about? <laughs> I don't think I can spell the word, let alone know what it means. But that was discipling, and he saw in me something I didn't see in myself. And so we started this journey with the church. I ended up going to college the next year or so and kept, kept going. But being thoroughly equipped doesn't mean having all of these certificates and, and degrees. That can be helpful if God's calling into, us, into a certain role that might need that. That's absolutely cool. Fine. But for all of us as well, this is where it starts, being equipped thoroughly in God's word. What is God saying? What, what does it mean for us? How do I apply it? How do I share, share it to someone else? So let me finish with, Paul finishes here on, on this idea of the origin and purpose of the scripture. And he says, firstly, the origin is from God. Scripture comes from God. We need to take it seriously. Scripture originated in God's mind. It says that he, he breathed it out into human authors. Scripture has two authors, God and the person God is, is communicating with. And their personalities are not the Gospels slightly different? They are, because they're coming, uh, not, not in areas of doctrine or whatever, but they're different because of the way they're expressing things. God is working through the human authors. It's his word. It comes from him. And we could talk about that a lot. And some of us are going to have very different opinions about that. And that's okay, so long as we agree to uh, focus on the key thing, which is what the word tells us. The, the, the Bible reveals Jesus. It reveals how we can be made right with him. And when Paul says here to know the scriptures and all scriptures inspired, he only had the Old Testament writings. The New Testament wasn't formed yet. So he only had the Old Testament, but we know the New Testament's part of it. Peter says in his writing that he uses Paul's writings to say this is scripture too. It's interesting what Peter does with Paul's writings, calling it scripture. Cool. But it hadn't been formed yet into the New Testament that we have. And so Paul is using the Old Testament here, but of course it goes through into the story of Jesus in the New Testament fully. So the origin is from God, full stop. But the purpose, let's focus on the purpose and finish with this. The purpose in verse 15 it provides wisdom leading to salvation. Beautiful. Wisdom. If we want not just knowledge, but wisdom, get into the word of God. Verse 15. Verse 16, it involves uh, teaching. If you like this road, teaching is staying on the right track, teaching us what is right. But we all know that we sort of go off the road sometimes. And so then Paul says the word of God is useful for rebuking. That's what is not right. So when we are rebuked, we're sort of we're told in God's word, hey, don't keep going down this path. You need to get back on God's path. And so that word is a strong word, but the word of God does this. It's one of its purposes. But it, we're not just left with a rebuke. The word of God corrects. It brings us back onto the right path. I love that with the word of God. Not just rebuking us, saying, Neil, you're wrong. But says, Neil, let me show you the right path. And so the word of God corrects us 
and helps us to get right, but then it trains us. It, keep, it trains us in how to keep right. I love the way the word does all of this. It keeps us on track. It helps us when we go off track. It brings us back on track. And it helps us continue on that track of training. And we're going to go to the left or right again. Absolutely. And the Word of God will be there with the Spirit of God to rebuke and correct and get us back on. God can use other people in that. And He can use His Word in that. But then I love these little people who then can get on with the journey. Oh, look at that. Beautiful. They can keep journeying. This is one of the major purposes of, or a few of the purposes of the Bible. Wisdom that leads to salvation, teaching, rebuking, correcting, training. And in the last verse, it says that the servant of God might become fully equipped, thoroughly equipped. Does any of this speak to you? This is the whole point of the word of God. What is God maybe saying to you? Maybe about the context you live in. Is there something about your world, your culture that you need to understand more clearly? To, to learn how to relate? Is there something about having someone to follow after, to help you, a discipler, a mentor? Maybe God's speaking to you about that, maybe either to get one or to be one. Come and talk to Darren or myself about that. Maybe it's continuing to serve, finding a place to continue to serve. Or maybe it's just getting into the Word of God and learning how to do that using our eyes, particularly to see what's in God's Word to see the treasure there. And maybe it starts with even realising this is treasure. Do we know the treasure in God's word? So next time you approach the word, go and buy a rock pick. Has anyone seen, what's the movie again? Shawshank Redemption, thank you. And he just, with the little rock pick, he actually gets out of the prison, (laughs) prison, but these little rock picks just chip away at rocks. Bring a rock pick and have it with you. Put it on the table as you hold this because the rock pick helps you get through to find the treasure. What is here that God wants you to see? It is treasure. So what is God saying to you about all of that today? I'm excited to hear some of those answers. Let's talk to each other because this really matters, to be thoroughly equipped.